All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. In the wake of the grand success of Eritrealized comic Isom, produced by his own publishing company Ripperverse, which grossed over $3.7 million, far outpacing its original goal of $100,000 by over 3,000%. A major indie comic smashing all expectations with groundbreaking success, which was brilliantly marketed by Rippa with what he called the Ripperverse ethic, which is made up of three major promises. Respect the customer, respect the canon and continuity, and have a comprehensive timeline which makes the events of the comic book easily accessible. And of course, no current year politics. While some have claimed this comic to be anti-woke, or as a shot fired at the 2020 era American comics that emphasize trendy political topics over all else. But as someone who has read the comic, I can safely say that Eric July's Isom number one is only anti-woke by virtue of its traditional storytelling. But with Eric July's historical success also came its inevitable backlash at detractors, and while one might claim them as critics, a great many approach the so-called criticism with plenty of bad faith. What's the, all right, what is the problem with people being enthusiastic about a comic book project? Or a new comic book universe. What okay. is the problem? All right. no, so, but, but, no but, problem all right, that. there's no problem with that, but you're, you're seeming to be upset with that. That people have, have expressed that they are excited about our project. Like, wh why would you frown upon that? I, I, like, this is the part that I don't get. Like, it's like you, you're just, you're upset just to be upset and you don't really know why you're mad at us. Oh, but you're selling hopium. What? Because people are enthusiastic about our project. What's the problem with that? I sold a book. People are stoked about it. People are stoked about the universe. What's the problem with that? Focusing more on the destruction of Eric July and his comic rather than good intent, often to hilarious results. From claiming that July would never finish Isom number one and would just run off with the money, despite July having the book already printed and ready to go long before the pre-order went live, to claiming July's success is artificial because he sold to his audience. Odd that Marvel, DC, Disney, or any other corporation cruising on franchises with built-in audiences aren't held to the same standard. If not his audience, who else is he supposed to sell to? This is why one of my rules for writing was know your audience. Who exactly are you writing for? Notions like these scream of bitterness rather than any level of sentience. Then there was trying to chastise July's project because it was packaged well. Yes, July destroyed his haters so badly and had so few negatives that they were reduced to naming quality service as a negative. I can also confirm that the comic arrived in a Gemini mailer, which is a cardboard shell specifically designed to protect comics from damage during transit. Something I'm fairly familiar with since it's the same package I used when I sent out Dr. Alpha Miracle Child. So far superior than the standard packaging. So many detractors pretend to speak from a place of authority on ISOM or its creation, when in reality, July's detractors really have no idea what they're talking about. I'm asking, you haven't pointed to one specific thing in the book at all. You have all these things to say about it, but you haven't pointed to one specific thing uh, with, uh, wrong with the book at all. You just keep calling it subpar. You say, I don't like it, but you're not even telling what? us what the problem is. But like here, the way it's formatted, the actual like text doesn't even like fit properly in the bubbles. The dialogue is well weird and clunky and bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey homie, hey homie, that's not from the book. That lettering is not from the book. Interesting note, Eric July's letterer is a talent named Eric Weathers, who kindly did the lettering for my own comic book, Dr. Alpha Miracle Child. Weathers is a top tier talent who's also quite popular in the indie sphere for top tier lettering quality. So, needless to say, the critique of the project hasn't been the greatest, and the bitterness has been palpable. In summary, dishonest to say the least. All of which led me to the decision to make my own critique of ISOM number one. So let's give it a go, shall we? ISOM is set in a superhero universe and centers around Avery Silman, a retired superhero once known as ISOM. Avery is literally called into the plot by his sister Altona when a family friend named Jasmine Newman goes missing and was last seen with another old acquaintance, Darren Fontano, who, as we'll soon learn, has built an empire. And we know this mainly because he talks about it 
like a vegan talks about how totally righteous their diet choice is. In Darren's own words, some of it the legal way, some of it not so much. Which, of course, is concerning since Jasmine was last seen with his power-hungry criminal overlord. Not a good sign. Darren spends some time insulting Avery with an impressively grounded speech, which points out how much potential Avery had and how he wasted all of that potential by amounting to nothing. After the speech, Darren admits he has Jasmine to quote, Whatever's going on with Jasmine is none of your concern. She's grown. This is what you're going to do. Tell her mother she's fine. Avery, of course, refuses to comply. Darren, of course, sends his goons after Avery, which introduces Avery's superhuman strength when he starts fighting the goons so hard he makes their insides explode. Then things take a turn when Elite shows up, who also has superpowers. He takes Avery by surprise and literally throws him out of the building and into another protagonist. This is Yaira, who showed up in the comic book earlier. I didn't mention it for reasons I'll explain later, but Yaira was busy fighting the Alpha Corps, a group of heroes who seem to be on the city's payroll. Though the beginning tells us that the Alpha Corps hasn't been needed for months because the crime has been so low. Yet Darren Fontaino has established and maintained a criminal empire. So the story seems to hint that the Alpha Corps may be corrupt, or at the very least, there might be more complexity to the situation. At this point, Avery thinks Yaira is another Fantano flunky, while Yaira assumes Avery is a super cop sent to stop her. The two tangle and their battle ends with Avery being smashed into a car, showing the audience that he might have super strength and durability, but can't fly. And then we're back at Avery's ranch, and we see that the allure of the city is tempting too many country folk to leave and damaging the surrounding economy. Me, seemingly setting up a future plot point, however, it doesn't seem to progress the current plot at all. Anyway, Avery is sent to the hospital and escapes off panel, then meets with his sister and explains what happened. Then Avery goes back to Club Merc, Darren Fantano's central headquarters, to take his revenge over the earlier disrespect. And this is when Avery actually runs into Jasmine, the missing girl from before, and asks her what's been happening. Jasmine seems far too terrified to respond. However, before the conversation can continue, a few of Darren's goons, who are apparently watching the girl very closely, decide to approach, and we're off. Avery goes on a rampage, fighting his way into Club Merc and annihilates Darren's henchmen. And this is where we get a rematch between Avery and Elite. And this time around, Avery wins. Then Avery runs to his sister's house to touch base. And this is where Altona shows Avery some security footage of Jasmine from before her disappearance. And it's implied that Darren may have been extorting Jasmine into compliance with his organization. To quote Darren from before, Lovely young ladies like Jasmine are useful to me at this juncture of my career. Avery decides things have gotten a little too serious and travels to a secret facility where they design costumes for superpowered people. The comic ends with a shot of Avery in his old superhero outfit, ready to step back into the fray. And that sums up the main story of ISOM number one. Now, how does it hold up narratively? First of all, the pledge to prevent current year politics from invading the story is kept. No preachy message or really any politics at all. Not even Eric's. In fact, he tries so hard to avoid adding any current year politics or anything remotely close to current year politics that the narrative seems to steer into overcorrection and ultimately carries very little dramatic weight. There is no lesson or point that's trying to overtly explore within the confines of ISOM number one. And I don't even mean anything political. Rather, some underlying meaning, which could be something as simple yet profound as, with great power comes great responsibility. While some such meaning could be conveyed in a future installment, such an arc is not completed in ISOM number one, a book that ranges around 75 pages for its main story. In other words, the story, while serviceable, is rather bland like the bread and water of narratives. While that might cure one's hunger, there's very little flavor and very little nutrition. After all, a man cannot live on bread alone. But let's dive into the details, shall we? The baseline story is the classic, hero gets called out of retirement to battle a major threat. Simple plot with an easily identifiable tangible goal, which allows July to allocate more time to character and world building. In this case, the tangible goal is to defeat Darren Fontaino. And then we have Darren's first villainous speech, which essentially signifies he and Avery's first meeting within the story, which gives us bits of drama and character development, but more importantly, sparks the plot. He said things like, You spent the next years being a subpar student. That fine sister of yours outperformed you academically and athletically, but you never seemed envious. That made me curious. And then my favorite line, You were cool, but I didn't admire admire you. You had both your parents around, a good household, and somehow you managed to amount to nothing. 
You just faded into the shadows, barely heard from, set up for success, and you did nothing with it. Not only is Darren openly disrespecting Avery to his face, but this speech details both of their characters perfectly. Darren is both confused and bewildered by all of Avery's benefits and his choice not to excel with them. Darren is ambitious. This man built an empire and did so by any means possible. He cannot comprehend the idea of a man given so much and then choosing to do so little with it. To quote, when people like me go away like that, we're usually dead or in jail. Yet, I built myself an empire. Some of it the legal way, some of it not so much. But an empire nonetheless. At the same time, we're given a summary of Avery's character. An able man who either let his life slip by, or more likely, a man who never cared enough for fame and glory to make his name well known. Avery isn't a superstar like Emperor Darren. But at the same time, he's a successful business owner. A man like Darren can't seem to comprehend a life outside the spotlight and without power. At least not anymore, while Avery just prefers to be left alone. In summary, the speech not only sparks the plot, giving that precious inciting incident, it clearly defines both characters and more importantly, the stark differences between the two. However, despite the book's considerable length and all the things that occur within the story, narratively speaking, very little actually happens. Remember, this is Eric July's very first comic, and this kind of error is something I often see with new writers and have been seeing with many indie creators. I'd also like to state that these mistakes stand out to me because I've made these mistakes myself. After all, everyone has to start somewhere. And to July's credit, he's managed to avoid many pitfalls new writers tend to fall for. The dialogue is serviceable, the characters are balanced, the world feels relatively believable, and Avery might arguably be a stand-in, but he isn't a Mary Sue. So the then what do I mean when I say very little happens? Here's the short version. Avery has two main goals throughout ISOM number one. Retrieve Jasmine from Darren Fontaino, which then switches to defeat Darren Fontaino. Neither of these are accomplished. Of course, Fontaino doesn't need to be taken down in the very first issue, but Avery doesn't really achieve a major victory either. Like how Luke Skywalker failed to defeat Darth Vader or the Emperor in A New Hope, but did strike a major blow to the Empire by destroying the Death Star. We do have Avery Avery get his revenge on Darren's elite henchmen, but Darren seems to have plenty of underlings, and the story never makes it clear how important that particular henchman is. Nor did Avery have to change his body or mindset to win in the second round, which would inspire character development. The main story is about 75 pages, and unfortunately, ISOM number one's only narratively significant accomplishment is starting the story, i.e. sparking the conflict. Let's start from the top. The hero's journey is probably one of the most recognizable story structures to anyone even remotely familiar with narrative construction. Now let's have a quick rundown of the pieces. Young man begins in an ordinary world, usually his home village, then he's called to adventure. Then he might refuse the call. Like maybe a band of adventurers passing through and, seeing his potential, invite him to help slay an evil dragon. The boy refuses, not wanting to leave. Then something happens, forcing his hand. And then, usually, a crisis emerges. Maybe the dragon attacks, destroying the boy's village and sparking his course of revenge. Then he might face a threshold guardian, which is usually a challenge he faces before breaking free from the ordinary world and stepping into the extraordinary one. The hero usually gets training from a mentor and endures a road of trials which challenge him on every level, physically, mentally, morally. Then the hero must encounter death and rebirth, which is fancy literary speak for the final test. This is where he faces the dragon. We can continue the journey from there and see the hero gain his rewards, maybe marry a princess, and then return home to help rebuild and ultimately become a teacher to the new generation. But for Isom, we don't need the full circle. We just need an arc. To simplify, an arc needs three basic things to work. A beginning where we set a tangible goal, like winning something, escaping something, stopping something, or retrieving something. Second, we have the middle, which is usually comprised of the actions taken to achieve this goal. And third, accomplishing the goal. The arc is what gives a story substance, and it's the lack of an arc that effectively guts the narrative of Isom number one. The overarching goal is made clear from the get-go, stop Darren Fontaino. Sure, there's Jasmine, but it's made fairly clear that Avery's main concern is taking Darren down. In a standalone story, the middle would be Avery working to weaken Darren's business to make him more vulnerable. The task, requiring Avery to grow and overcome personal challenges, and then ultimately defeat Darren, creating a complete arc. However, Isom 
as an ongoing narrative with an overarching story and stopping Darren is its overarching goal, which means Darren isn't getting defeated quite yet. So what's the solution? Well, just because each issue of ISOM is a single piece of a larger story doesn't mean each piece can't have its own narrative arc. Kind of like the legendary journey of Samurai Jack, whose overarching goal is to slay the evil Aku, yet each episode is its own story with a beginning, middle, and end. So how does this pertain to ISOM's story specifically? There's a reason why I skipped the first few pages earlier and jumped right into Avery's story. Because ISOM does not begin with Avery's story. Of course, there's nothing wrong with beginning at another section of the narrative and delaying your main character's introduction until later. After all, Columbo famously did this when they regularly delayed Columbo's entrance until much later in the story, giving priority to the murderer, the murder, and how they committed the crime. The first few pages are the most critical when catching the attention of potential readers. This is why a comic beginning with the main character is such a popular choice. Another option is starting with an inciting incident. In other words, sparking the plot that the central character will soon find themselves entangled in. However, I saw number one doesn't do this. Instead, we begin with a set of characters we don't see again, and the teaser ends with reference to a woman returning. And we can only assume this is reference to Yaira, who shows up later. And speaking of Yaira, other than running into Avery and slamming him into a car, she literally has no effect on the plot. Even when she sends Avery to the hospital, he just escapes almost immediately. No harm done. As is, July could have just cut the whole scene and nothing would change. A problem made worse by having Isom number one dedicate its opening pages to a character who has nothing to do with the plot of Isom number one. On a narrative level, the whole story can be cut down to Avery gets called by his sister to investigate Jasmine's disappearance, Avery confronts Darren Fontaino, a fight happens, and Avery is defeated by elite Darren's superpowered henchmen. And with what we're given, narrative wise, it would have been best if issue number Number one ended there. Because after this, Avery just goes back to fight Darren and his men again, with no sense of character development between the first and second fight. No training, no enlightenment, no attempt to learn who Elite is, or find a weakness to gain an advantage. To put it simply, Avery might as well have just gotten back up and defeat Elite right there. So there's the problem. The ideal pattern of a story is which leads to. For example, Avery gets a call from his sister, which leads to him going back to the city, which leads to his confrontation with Darren Fontaino, which leads to a battle, which leads to Darren calling Elite, which leads to Avery being beaten by Elite. But after Avery gets kicked out of Club Merc, the following events mostly fall into a pattern of, and then this happened, and then Avery escapes the hospital, and then he talks to his sister, and then he goes back to the club for revenge, which sticks events together so they might give the illusion of flow, but they aren't really connected. This is why the starter pages can be skipped. They don't lead into anything. They don't spark the plot or set up a twist or even set up a relevant plot point. It just points out that the Alpha Core exists and hints at the existence of Yaira. It does add some world building, but nothing substantial and certainly nothing worth sacrificing the opening pages for. The narrative technically begins with the police chief getting news that Yaira has returned and then we promptly go to Avery. While Yaira and Alpha Core do show up in the story, their only contribution to Avery's tale is is to beat him up a little more, after he's already been beaten by Elite, which leads up to the story arc. Unfortunately, Isom number one adheres more to spectacle, which means there's plenty of action, but not a lot of narrative meaning behind it. To summarize, instead of an arc, we have a straight line. Remember when I went over the hero's journey? The arc of the hero's journey typically consists of growth, development or change. But Avery, unfortunately, does not. He just fights Darren's goons, gets beaten, and then goes back and wins, and then gets a super suit. The closest we get to any kind of development is a point where Avery apparently sits in his car for a few hours, planning out his attack. But counting this will be Mother Teresa levels of generosity. Why? Because nothing was earned. For example, had we seen Avery go through some kind of change or gain some kind of enlightenment, we could grant him a moment of concocting some unseen plan the audience will sue see unfold. But we don't get that. The curve of the arc concerns an incurring change, a hero learning skills, overcoming a flaw, or attaining new knowledge, or anything else of that nature. However, throughout the story, Avery doesn't change in any narratively significant way. For example, the closest thing we get to a completed arc is Avery's rivalry with Elite. But even then, we fail to get a story arc, since Avery just goes back to Club Merc the same day and beats him up the second time around. Again, no training or skill improvement or 
even a moment where Avery gains new knowledge to better understand his opponents. I suppose here is where some might be asking, how else could it have been written? The most frustrating thing about ISM number one is that most of the elements are there, and with a little rearranging it could have been far more substantial. As is, we'll cut the Alpha Core and Yara elements from the story. So what should we put for the opening pages? Easy. Towards the end, we saw camera footage of Jasmine before she disappeared. Why not just let the scene play out? In other words, open with this scene. Begin ISM number one with Jasmine strong-armed into missing her appointment and starting work for Darren Fontaineau. We don't even need everything. Just have Jasmine begin defiant against Darren's offer, which leads to the threatening phone call. We don't see what's been said, but we know whatever it was changed Jasmine's mind. Jasmine starts off defiant, which leads to mysterious threat, which leads to Jasmine's disappearance. Then all of this leads to Altona giving Avery a call. Hall. Avery still meets with Darren, fights his men, and gets defeated by Elite. Then he's sent to the hospital. And this is where we start making heavier changes. Avery is seriously hurt. Nothing life-threatening, of course, but wounded enough to stay in the hospital. Of course, it would be reasonable for Altona to be called in as Avery's emergency contact. And the exchange the two originally had in the parking lot can be had in Avery's room while he recovers. At this point, Altona can even bring in her daughter so we're introduced to her early on in the book instead of at the end. Altona tells us more more about Jasmine, maybe even about other girls who met the same fate, all because of Darren. Note, July makes it clear that Altona is the knighted smart person of the story, and smart characters are time savers, since a writer can use them to know relevant information without needing the hero to discover things on his own. So we might as well utilize the character. Here's what I mean. Altona might give us a quick summary of Darren's affairs, what he's capable of, and how far his influences reach. This way, the reader can gauge how evil Darren is, how urgently he needs to be stopped, and how large a task it's going to be. This is when Avery might have a change of heart. He realizes how serious things are, and how much he's lost since leaving the superhero game. Now, two things can happen from here depending on July's intentions. If a longer time span is acceptable, Avery can be out for a week or two as he recovers and starts training up a bit. Or he can go the same night, weakened and injured. But with two benefits he didn't have before. First is Altona giving him a briefing on Elite, allowing Avery to find a few weaknesses. Second, in either scenario, Avery should get his costume back. Not only because just having a super suit might grant him some advantages, but it would serve as a visual change for the reader, signifying that Avery is taking things seriously and that Isom has returned. This is when Avery makes another go at Club Merc, and the story ends with Avery defeating Elite using a combination of battle tactics and intellect to exploit his weaknesses and outmaneuver him. This would solidify an ISOM victory, definitively signaling his return, and that the war against Darren has just begun. Now, to summarize the new narrative flow using some applied theory, Jasmine is strong-armed into working for Darren, which leads to Altona calling Avery to investigate, which leads to Avery confronting Darren at Club Merc, which leads to a fight, which leads to Avery being defeated by Elite, which leads to Avery hospitalized, which leads to Altona visiting him, which leads to Avery learning about Darren, Jasmine, the disappearing girls, and Elite's weaknesses, which leads to Avery deciding to take things seriously, which leads to him putting together a plan, and recovering his super suit, which leads to the second confrontation, which leads to the rematch with Elite, which leads to Avery using his newfound knowledge, which leads to Avery's victory. Elite's loss shows us that Avery has grown, and that his state of mind has changed from relatively selfish to more heroic. Now, let's go over the stuff we cut. First off, Yaira. The original appearance adds nothing to the narrative of ISOM number one, but if you want to add her in, maybe save her as a teaser. Make the final page ISOM encountering Yaira, and leave the reader wondering what the outcome will be. Next are Darren's speeches. Darren gives two speeches over the course of the story. There isn't really one way to handle this, but my go-to choice is to keep the original speech where Darren mocks Avery. The Empire speech would be an ideal starter for ISOM number two. Then there's the Alpha Core. There actually isn't a lot ISOM number one gives us about the Alpha Core, other than they seem to be heroes on the government's paycheck, and that's why they're Yaira's enemy. However, despite the lack of information, this setup alone gives us an awesome premise for ISOM number two. ISOM versus the Alpha Core. Raising the stakes, since ISOM won't be fighting petty powered up criminals, but super powered professionals. And most of the farm sections, each of which could be saved for the second book. A literal meanwhile back at the farm moment. Because in ISOM number one, the farm sections add nothing to the central narrative. And the last thing we see is Sam going into a building, gun drawn. Much better to leave these for ISOM number two, where we have more room to expand on whatever plot July has planned for Sam and the others. In the end, Air July's ISOM number one is serviceable. It's fun, has a masculinely 
leading man, a threatening enemy, and an interesting cast of characters. And of course, no current year politics, no lecturing, no stopping the story to cry about fictional oppression, and no need to spend any time detailing the sexuality of every character. The narrative flow needs considerable work, and the story might feel a little bit empty, but there are plenty of good things about ISOM 2. Whether you would classify this as a good comic or not is your decision, but ultimately, ISOM is a promising first go for a new writer, and it certainly stands in a much higher league than many other American comics, both corporate and indie alike. While July's first venture into writing may not be a flawless masterpiece, it remains a refreshing change of pace from the typical corporate American swill. Eric July's dedication not only to storytelling, but also a firm adherence to his stated principles. To respect the customer, to respect the canon and continuity, and to respect its timeline, making it easily accessible. In fact, these core principles might be the major driving factor for a success, since in true capitalist fashion, July saw a huge demand that simply wasn't being met by the mainstream. And that demand wasn't for stories, but respect. While some speculate that July's multi-million dollar success came from an angry audience wanting to slam down their dollar to fight the woke, this was never July's stated goal. And revenge wasn't what he was offering. If one goes by what he actually says about his business rather than what they want him to say, the truth becomes clear. And the truth is... Ripperverse never promised to crush the leftist woke. He promised respect, something of a commodity in an era where the mainstream has become rather hostile towards its own customers. To avoid the tedious distraction of political agenda, allowing the readers to focus on the adventure at hand. Although there's room for improvement, this debut issue showcases potential and is a commendable effort by a new writer. Because, despite its success or flaws, July's passion and the work he and his team put into the story is clear. And I am left intrigued as to where the story will go and what improvements July will make. After all, to me at least, watching a writer actively improve is a big part of the fun, especially in the indie scene. And as Neil Gaiman once said, the one thing that you have that nobody else has is you. Your voice, your mind, your story, your vision.